Welcome everyone, Kroiso. I'm Dr. Kamant Kajuri and I will be hosting Wales and the World's event this evening. We will have Dr. Sarah Gamble who will present her paper on Harley Quinn's tattoos and other stories of women with ink. Uh, and now it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Sarah Gamble, who is an associate professor in English with gender here at Swansea University. And her title neatly pairs her two main academic interests. 20th and 21st century literature and gender and queer theory. She teaches at both undergraduate and postgraduate levels and is committed to fostering student engagement through innovative and inventive teaching practices. And in 2012, she was the recipient of a distinguished teaching award. Uh, Dr. Gamble specializes on the life and work uh, of Angela Carter, on whom she published the first full-length scholarly monograph in 1997, Angela Carter, Writing from the Front Line. In 2004, she published Angela Carter, A Literary Life, which narrates Carter's life through the study of her writing. Dr. Gamble is also the editor of the Routledge Guide to Feminism and Post-Feminism and uh, Angela Carter, a Reader's Guide to Essential Criticism. And she's also co-editor of Ludics and Laughter as um, Feminist Aesthetic, Angela Carter at Play, which I believe was published earlier this year. In addition, uh, she has published numerous articles on contemporary women's fiction, uh, the gothic and fantastic. She is currently embarking on a new monograph, and I don't really know how she finds the time, um, but this monograph aims to examine the influence of art on Angela Carter's writing. Dr. Gamble, it is a pleasure and an honor to have you with us. Thank you very much. Um, I should say as well that this paper is coming out of um, research I'm doing at the moment. I'm, I'm moving, you know, my, my whole life seems to be Angela Carter centric and therefore I'm um, currently pursuing um, alongside work on Carter, but I'm currently pursuing a project which I hope will result in a monograph on tattooing and gender. So this is a new area for me and um, the paper that I'm giving this evening is really bringing together um, two areas that I've been looking at that I hope will become eventually separate chapters in, um, in the final work. Um, but for the purpose of this talk, um, I'm, I'm kind of putting together two particular figures. Um, so I actually want to begin because, you know, it's a kind of a law in, in Sarah Gamble world that you can't give a talk without mentioning Angela Carter, even if it's not actually on Angela Carter. And I want to begin with um, two quotations from Angela Carter's nonfiction writings, because she was very interested in, um, in self-fashioning. She was very interested in how we present ourselves to the world. She also is a very early, um, writing in the 60s and 70s, she was representing tattoos in her work um, before they were fashionable. So these are the two quotations that I want to begin with. She once um, opined that, quote, everyone's clothes are their own symbolic autobiography. And she also said, you can't walk down the street without making a political statement. And I think that these two quotations draw attention to the way in which we all quite literally fashion ourselves to be read by others, whether we intend to or not. I mean, not being fashionable, not looking like you care what you look like is in itself a statement. You cannot avoid it. So our styling of ourselves broadcasts a story to observers of who we are, or at least how we want to be seen by and in the world. And of course, this spreads beyond clothing and hairstyles. In this paper, I'm interested in what happens when we begin to inscribe such autobiographical narratives onto our bodies and into our skin. Now, most elements of self-fashioning are temporary and changeable. We take off our clothes at night and put on new ones in the morning, thus getting the chance to rewrite our symbolic presentation of self at the beginning of every day and over time. But it's difficult to do that with tattoos. I mean, you can remove tattoos, but it's a long, laborious and expensive process still. 
Um, you can also overwrite tattoos with other images. I'm going to be talking about that um, later on. But nevertheless, that's very, very different from being, from being able to take off a t-shirt and put on a new one. So while material fashion indicates how we think of ourselves at any particular moment, you know, th those culottes that we might have worn one year, we wouldn't be seen dead in the next. Um, tattoos are sedimentary, they are layered. They create a layered narrat narrative, which ineradicably accumulates a series of moments across time. So what stories do tattoos tell? What, how can we interpret those stories? So what I want to present you with this evening are two ideas of stories. I'm all through, I'm going to be talking, I'm going to be talking about doubleness and about layering, double layers. The first way of thinking about tattooing and story, as I've already indicated, um, is that as the historical narrative of an individual written upon their body. Subject matter, style and placement, where the, where the tattoo is actually situated on the body, what parts of your body are tattooed, all have a crucial part to play in forming an, an image-based symbolic lexis unique to the self that bears it. However, as well as looking um, at the stories told by tattoos, which I'm going to do by um, examining the film incarnation of, or the cinematic incarnation of the um, anti-heroine Harley Quinn. Um, I also want to look at stories of tattooing, the lady who tattoos. In particular, those stories that tend to have been left out of official histories of the art form, such as they exist. And these tend to be the story the stories of, of women who tattoo. And this is um, a picture, I love this series of pictures. Um, this is the tattoo artist, Jessie Knight. And I love this series because you've got the, the woman screaming, screaming in pain as she has the tattoo um, done. And then she's really pleased with it and all her friends gather around and have a look at it. It's sort of, you know, the experience of tattooing in a nutshell, I think. Um, so I'm going to be looking at the tattooed lady and the lady who tattoos. And for the sake of brevity, I'm going to concentrate on only two figures. There's so many other um, figures I could talk about, but I've chosen two. One is fictional, one is real. As I've said, the first is the comic book character Harley Quinn in her cinematic incarnation. The second, the tattooist Jessie Knight. And although this may seem like an incongruous pairing, they come together to tell an interesting story about gender and tattooing from the point of view of the one who is tattooed and the one who does the tattooing. The fictional character who presents herself to us for interpretation and the real life woman who is a little known pioneer for female tattoo artists in a male dominated and historically quite misogynistic profession. So let's begin with, why are you not working? Harley Quinn. Um, I don't know how many of you are, are comic book fans or have um, seen Harley Quinn in any of her cultural um, representations, but she started off life as a comic book character who is part of the DC comic universe, where she's the girlfriend, or she has been, the has been is important to my talk, she has been the girlfriend of Batman's perennial adversary, the Joker. With the success of the recent films in which she has appeared, played by Margot Robbie, and, and it's Margot Robbie that you'll see in most of the images that I'll be showing you this evening. I apologize for the, for the, for the doggy interruption. Um, the two films are Suicide Squad, which came out in 2016, and Birds of Prey, which was released in 2020, as well as an animated series called Harley Quinn. Um, the first series aired in 2019, and we're now on the second series, which is airing certainly in the UK now. This character is having something of a cultural moment. She's, because she's evolved from being a very minor character to being one of the most popular characters in the D and certainly one of those popular female characters in the DC universe. Now, when she first appeared in 1992, these are some early illustrations here. 
Harley, as her name denotes, embodied the characteristics of the Harlequin. Harley, Quinn, Harlequin. Um, the Harlequin began life as a stock figure in traditional Italian commedia dell'arte, where he was characterized by his diamond patterned costume. Just as the original Harlequin role was a secondary one as a comical servant, so Harley functioned as a kind of sidekick or hench girl character defined only by her slavish devotion to her abusive boyfriend. And it's kind of summed up in this central image. This is the Joker here. She's literally sitting at his feet. Um, in fact, in Birds of Prey, there's one point at which Harley, having split up with the Joker, says to another character called Black Canary, um, do you know what a Harlequin is? Um, a Harlequin is meant to serve, a Harlequin needs a master. And so um, this servile aspect of the Harlequin character was very strongly expressed in the earliest incarnations of Harley Quinn. Uh, but as time has gone on, focus has come to be placed on her journey back to an independent self. Um, I think it was in 2011 that DC Comics began um, a comic series which traced Harley's adventures after her breakup with the Joker. And both the animated series Harley Quinn and the film Birds of Prey depict her in this stage of her life where she has, she has actually escaped the clutches of this abusive relationship. And thus she is removed from his shadow and it allows her to develop as a more triumphal character who has escaped a traumatic and abusive relationship. And to underline this, in fact, Birds of Prey has a, the 2020 film has a subtitle, which is, and the fantabulous emancipation of one Harley Quinn. So you are led to, you're, you know, it's very much foregrounded that this is a film about emancipation, not civility. Now, what I find most interesting is that an addiction to ink has only been incorporated into Harley's character in the recent film adaptations. So you can see, you know, in all these various um, permutations of the Harley Quinn image, tattoos do not appear. It is only from um, uh, the, the, in, the, in the recent films that she has been portrayed as being covered with tattoos. And I want to argue in this paper that these tattoos are of enormous cultural and narrative significance. They demonstrate the ability of tattoos to tell the stories of the bodies on which they're inscribed. If you watch Birds, Birds of Prey, no attention is drawn to Harley's tattoos at all. They're just there. But if you read them, they tell you a story about her. Um, they, they have rich textual and symbolic meanings, which are not directly addressed in the, in the film itself. And this aspect of Harley Quinn's contemporary presentation not only supports Michael Reese's argument that, quote, body work has become an established part of contemporary culture, but it also acts as a record of the character's dark history. So in her most recent incarnation, this is in Suicide Squad and Birds of Prey, where she's played by Margot Robbie, she has around 17 visible tattoos across her body and they vary widely in both style and quality. And this fact in itself is meaningful since it demonstrates that they've not been curated. In other words, they've not been carefully chosen to fit a predetermined theme and perhaps even tattooed by the same artist in order to ensure consistency of application and style. A very common approach now is to, is to have a bespoke tattoo. So if you want a tattoo sleeve all down your arm, you go to a um, tattooist, you design the sleeve together and you have it done over a period of sittings. But this isn't like that. This is a random accumulation of tattoos over time. Um, and thus they don't really match aesthetically. There's nothing that's aesthetically pleasing about these tattoos. They're not fashionable tattoos by any means. Um, so um, the very bad and badly faded, you can see it here, Colour tattoo depicting a dolphin and a rainbow um, on Harley's left hip bone bears no relation to the grey and black, sorry, to the black and grey tattoos, mostly script, with which it has become surrounded. So you've got, you know, this little tattoo here, and then lucky you added later. 
Um, and, you know, the innocence of this is juxtaposed by the, um, the naughtiness, the, the, the potential salaciousness of the script. And I think we can be, we can surmise that the ta this tattoo is a relic of pre-Joker Harley, Harley before she became Harley Quinn. Um, you know, this is a young girl's tattoo. This, however, is something far darker. In fact, apart from the dolphin on her hip and the black, grey and red um, Harlequin pattern around her right, right wrist, which is a gesture actually towards her original role as a Harlequin, um, Harley's tattoos are all black and grey, so they're not coloured. And they bear a strong similarity as well to the Hispanic tattoo style, which is distinguished not only by its lack of colour, but also by the use of elaborate cursive fonts. Now, for anyone who knows how to read tattoos, this itself is meaningful because Harley's adoption of this style is ever so slightly incongruous. In her former life, before she meets the Joker, she was Dr. Harleen Quinzel, a white Jewish woman with a doctorate in psychology and thus not necessarily the most obvious candidate to sport Latinx street tattoos. However, her obsession with the Joker has also reduced her social status. Once a psychiatrist, she is now the object of psychoanalysis. Once someone who treated the criminally insane, she now herself is mad. The fact that the Hispanic tattoo style has its origins amongst the Latino inmates of the US prison system, they would tattoo themselves with tattoo guns made out of um, biros. Um, conveys this upending of mind and status strongly. So they indicate her kind of slide down the social scale and the scale of sanity, if you like. And this is cemented by the tattoos that we see on Harley's thighs. Harley has extensively tattooed thighs. And these are prison tattoos in their crudest and most literal form. They are self-administered, uh, probably using, um, many of them probably using stick and poke, or if using a tattoo gun, and there, there is a shot in um, Birds of Prey of her, of her using a tattoo gun on herself, they're done by someone without any training. Um, so they're very, very crude, and they're also upside down, if you notice, because it's very difficult to tattoo your own thighs the right way up for anyone who's looking. So these are all self-administered upside down tattoos. Um, and they're either done by Harley herself during one of her stints as an inmate in, in um, Arkham Asylum, which is the same institution in which she was once a psychiatric practitioner, or in the aftermath of her breakup with the Joker. And in fact, in a scene in, um, in Birds of Prey, we see her sobbing and tattooing her own thigh. Um, and all of these are not only, you know, horrible, amateur, ugly tattoos, but they are also, they convey an ugly sentiment. They are all to do with her fixation on the Joker. Pudding is her nickname for him. So you have Pudding and Harley, I'll wait forever. And then on her other thigh, let me tell you a secret. I love Pudding, Harley and Pudding. So they are a record um, of her obsession with this boyfriend who nevertheless continually uses and abuses her. And this is shown by the tattoos on Harley's face. Um, a small black heart on her right cheek and the word rotten inscribed on her right jawline. Now, research has shown, as if research was needed, that tattoos that can't be covered up, tattoos on the hand, on the neck and on the face, um, are particularly stigmatized. And therefore to tattoo your face is still a very strong statement to make. Um, and moreover, the adjective rotten itself appears to be directed at Harley. It's not a comment to the rest of the world, this is a comment on Harley. Thus further emphasizing that taken together, the dominant narrative being told by her collection of tattoos is one of self-disgust and self-abnegation. And she has other tattoos like this, which support this argument. She has Daddy's Little Monster um, tattooed on her right clavicle and on her right shoulder blade she has Property of Joker 
and a tattoo and um, I think the most chilling is the tattoo of the eyes and I'm watching you on her lower back. So this in other words is a body completely and apparently willingly under the control of another and indeed in her online article entitled Harley Quinn's terrible tattoos are the best part of birds of prey Leanne Butkovic postulates that quote we can assume Harley's ex did them and she's referring to these tattoos Carly could not have done these herself you can't you can't really tattoo your own back and she postulates that actually the joker did them we know from she she goes on to say from a birds of prey flashback that the crown prince and princess of crime have weaponized a tattoo gun for at least one prank inking clown makeup all over a tough guy's face stuck in a toxic codependent relationship it seems without question that the joker and harley would sadistically and masochistically inflict pain on one another with shitty art that is meant to last forever. Joker stamping his former psychiatrist turned partner in crime is like marking his eternal property. So this is a really chilling interpretation um, of these tattoos as evidence of abuse and a co-option of a woman's body. So these tattoos are telling a story of trauma and the complete loss of an independent self. The tattoos across Harley's body do not just mark her as mad, bad and delinquent. Many of them directly tell the observer that this is what she is. This is not therefore tattooing as it's so often thought of as an expression of, of the independent self, but as an elaborate performative elimination of the self at the hands of another. And as her prison tattoos demonstrate, even when Harley tattoos herself, she continues this narrative, so thoroughly has she internalized it. So read in this sense, Harley's tattoos appear to run counter to Kimberly Bolzer Gerais and Tanya Rodriguez's optimistic argument that, quote, a tattooed woman redefines beauty on her own terms. The female fleshy canvas participates in a distinct category of art, creating its own feminist aesthetic. The tattooed woman says, you want to look at my body? I'll give you something to look at. Like other feminist artists, she asserts agency, directing the gaze according to her will. End of quote. But far from asserting this kind of confident empowerment, Harley's tattoos become another aspect of the traditional function of female bodies, which in the words of the female, of the feminist philosopher Elizabeth Gross, are inscribed, marked, engraved by social pressures external to them. You know, the argument is, is that women throughout history have been read according to um, male authored symbolic um, thoughts about what they expect women to be and what they want women to be. And in this um, context, the Joker's tattoos become part of this. This is what he wants Harley to be. But, I want to offer you another more optimistic reading. Is this entirely the case? As I said earlier in this paper, contemporary depictions of the Harley Quinn character focus not on her relationship with the Joker, but her escape from it. Her horrible, terrible tattoos could, as I've indicated, be read negatively as showing that she could never escape from the trauma of that relationship and that the Joker has indeed succeeded in his aim of marking her as his, as his eternal property. But I don't think this is an inter this, we can endorse this interpretation. It's true at one time, but Harley's story keeps evolving and with it, her tattoos are also evolving. I would argue that over time, we see Harley transcending the message of her body art. Her, her, her body art. She is no longer daddy's little monster, but her own. What we must not forget is that emancipated Harley does not go back to respectability and the world of the untattooed good girl, if indeed she was ever a good girl to start off with, but instead redefines deviancy on her own terms and in her own language. In this light, her tattoos come to symbolise what she survived, not who she any longer believes herself to be. And proof of this line of argument 
can be found in the advanced publicity surrounding the sequel to Suicide Squad, called rather <laughs> unimaginatively The Suicide Squad, due for release at the end of this month, July 2021. And this film continues Harley's emancipatory narrative, and this is emphasised by alterations to her tattoos. And although this film has not yet been released, people are very interested in what has happened to Harley's tattoos. What I find most interesting is that her rotten tattoo, the one that you see here, has in the second film simply vanishes. Well, it's one of the advantages, of course, of being a fictional character. Um, you know, tattoos can just disappear. Um, James Gunn, the director of The Suicide Squad, um, answered a question about this on Twitter. What led to the decision of removing the rotten tattoo on Harles and will it be addressed, asked somebody. And his reply was Margot, Margot Robbie, the actress, didn't like it and, and found out I also didn't like it. So we decided just to remove it. No, it's not addressed. And I think that's very interesting because it shows how truly disturbing that tattoo is. Um, the fact that even Margot Robbie herself did not like having it on her skin. And so it's now simply vanished, it's, it's gone. She still has the heart, but she no longer has rotten written on her face. In addition, um, the tattoo that I've already discussed on her back, which read property of the Joker has actually been amended I think we're meant to assume that she's gone to a tattooist and had um, and had the tattoo altered. It no longer reads property of the Joker. It reads property of no one. And interestingly as well, um, if I go back to the opening picture, you can see here that as well, the J for Joker on her arm has now become the tail of a mermaid. So she has over time we are led to think altered her tattoos and they're beginning to tell a different story. I referred at the beginning of this paper to tattoos as a sedimentary narrative and this can be seen in action with regards to Harley Quinn whose self-hatred is in the process of being overwritten by new symbolism that hints at her rebirth as an independent subject. So tattoos may be permanent but they are not immutable, they can be changed, they can be overwritten. So that's the end of the first part of my talk. I now want to move on to another character. Now, this is still, my, my research on Jesse Knight um, is still in the early stages, and I think I will have much more to tell in the future. But this is the story of Jesse Knight. Not a fictional character, but a real one. Completely forgotten outside her family circle, who have actually kept all her writings and diaries, and you can now find them on a Facebook page. Um, Knight's came to public, Knight's story, sorry, came to public attention when it was included by the scholar Margot Mifflin in a revised edition of her book, Bodies of Subversion, A Secret History of Women and Tattoo. Um, that revised um, edition was published in 2013. Knight has since been featured in a touring exhibition of British tattooing called Tattoo, British Tattoo Art Revealed, which kicked off in 2018, which has drawn more attention to her life and work. Now, what's most interesting about Jessie Knight, uh, or one of the many interesting things about Jessie Knight, is that she has local interest for us here in Swansea. Um, she was born in Bristol in 1904, and she learned her craft from her father, who started off life as a sailor, but was also a circus performer. And Knight grew up in the circus, learning various unladylike pursuits, like trick riding and sharpshooting. And she earned her living as a tattooist at a time when female tattoo artists were almost unheard of. She is believed to have been the only female tattoo artist working in Britain for at least three decades. Now, I'm not sure this is true. I suspect there were others, but she is, definitely the only known female tattoo artist working in Britain during from about the 1920s to the 1940s, 50s. She only gave her profession up briefly during her short and ultimately ill-fated marriage, which ended when she shot and injured her husband for kicking her dog down the stairs. And I think that was richly deserved. So she, she just, she, she had a, a revolver which someone had given her in exchange for a tattoo. He kicked a dog down the stairs, she grabbed the revolver and shot him in the leg and left him. 
She began her career very early. She, was a, she started off as a professional tattooist at only the age of 17, when she took over her father's tattoo shop in Barry. And in the course of her career, she also opened shops in Aldershot and Portsmouth. Notice they both have military um, or naval connections before returning to the Barry stu Tattoo Studio in 1968. And she continued to tattoo well into her old age, even after she'd officially retired, which I think she did when she was in her 70s, she would still tattoo friends and family from her own home. Now it's important to realise that Knight was not just a tattooist, she was a highly successful one in a period in which body art was disreputable, identified with the working classes, sailors, criminals and prostitutes, and female tattoo artists, as I've said, were virtually unheard of. But despite this, she wasn't just a professional tattoo artist, she was an ambitious um, professional tattoo artist. For example, in 1955, um, she entered the Champion Tattoo Artist of All England competition, and she came second with a large back piece tattoo of a Highland Fling competition, which you can see here. Nothing about Jessie Knight that I found out suggested that she saw being female as a hindrance. In fact, she played it up on her business cards, which described her in a kind of typical modest terms as, quote, the world famous Jessie Knight, expert freehand lady tattoo artist. So confident in her artistic skills was she that she scorned the use of stencils, drawing her designs freehand on the client's skin with a matchstick dipped in ink. And indeed, apparently what she would do, clients said that what she would do, she, was, she would light a match and she would hold the, the lit match in front of her client to show how steady her hands were. And this was her claim that she, this was how she could draw um, freehand. Um, these are example of some of her um, tattoo designs. The, there are a lot of them around, but you can see that, I mean, by the standards of our time, they, they are a bit crude, but nevertheless, I mean, they're highly colorful, highly inventive. Um, and she just had notebooks full of flash art. And indeed, by the standards of the time, Knight herself was heavily and scandalously tattooed. Her grandfather was a man called E.A. Lempriere Knight who was a minor published poet and a journalist. And her largest tattoo, this one, done by her father, is the Lempriere family crest. She also had smaller tattoos, including a spider. So she had various small tattoos around her body, but she also had this huge family crest. And I find this interesting. I think it's a sign that Knight traces her creative genealogy through paternal and not maternal lines. She cannot use her tattoos to pay tribute to a woman-centered history because she doesn't have one. Tattooing and her creative talent comes to her from men, from her father and from her grandfather. Now Knight was never allowed to forget by others that she was an intruder into a male creative space. For despite her public flamboyance and professional success, Knight's gender meant that she was definitely seen as a tattoo outsider. Her shops were broken into, her designs stolen, and vicious rumours were spread about her. Um, primarily one that she didn't clean her equipment properly, that she didn't, you know, as a woman, she didn't really know how to sterilise tattoo equipment properly. And of course, you can predict it, that patriarchal response to any woman who disturbs the status quo, that she was promiscuous and, and led an immoral life. And Knight's diary, though, reveals defiance in the face of such attempted intimidation. And this is an extract from a poem that she wrote in around the 1940s. I've tattooed here, I've tattooed there, I've tattooed nearly everywhere. They call me this, they call me that. They call me a vampire and a nasty cat, but a tattoo artist I'll always be. So, Jessie Knight and Harley Quinn, for all their differences, thus come together within this space of resistance. A tattooed woman and a woman who tattoos are, it turns out, sisters under and also on the skin. A patriarchal society might try to inscribe their own meanings onto women's body, both symbolically and in Harley's case at least, literally, but both Knight and Harley in their various ways assert the power of tattoos to signify their ability to surmount, disrupt and rewrite 
male scripts and patriarchal stories. The tattoo historian Jane Kaplan argues that tattoos exist both, quote, on and under the surface of the skin. In this way, say Talia Ferro and Odden, a tattoo, quote, becomes a double skin in a sense. It is a physical object. The ink used in the drawing takes up tangible space, but it is also an inferred object, an image. I wish to claim this assertion of doubleness for gender discussion about tattoos and tattooing in order to argue that there are always two stories to tell, at least. Tattoos themselves constitute a symbolic narrative as I've shown through my reading of Harley Quinn's body. But dig deeper, and there's always further tales, further histories like that of Jesse Knight's to be found beyond the image itself. Thank you, that's it. Thank you, Diochen Varg, Dr. Gamble, for that fascinating talk. Uh, it's funny because I kept thinking back to many years ago when my twin sister and I wanted to get our first tattoos. Oh. And uh, we wrote a letter for my father. It was about four pages long, listing <laughs> all of the reasons uh, for wanting this tattoo and basically trying to justify getting this tattoo. Uh, so I really enjoyed this and I have a newfound appreciation for tattoos. Thank you. Did you get the tattoo? Yes. <laughs> We did. My father was quite relieved at the end of the letter to find uh, that we just wanted to get a tattoo. He, <laughs> he was so worried. Um, he was, he was, yeah, very anxious reading that letter. Uh, <laughs> so we do have one question already from Sophie, uh, who says, if I remember correctly, Harley Quinn has a baseball bat that is covered in images and text. So could that be an extension of her tattooed body as if a weapon against the world? That's really interesting. I hadn't thought of that. The Joker. Mm. Yeah, because also I suppose that the, um, you know, the appropriation of, if you want to get Freudian about it, of course, the appropriation of a, of a baseball bat could be read as phallic. It's also, of course, a male in America. In Britain, we call it rounders and girls do it. But in America, of course, it's, it's a much more prestigious sport and therefore it's a man's sport. It's a male sport. Um, so yes, I think it probably is a, um, an appropriation of, um, a, a sort of extension of her tattoos in that it becomes a subversive appropriation of male scripts, um, male ambitions. And of course, you know, she's a fighting, the fight scenes in, in Birds of Prey and Suicide Squad are brilliant. And of course, she's a very, very adept fighter as well. So she, she although she has this little girl persona, the tattoos, the baseball bat, the, the martial arts all, of course, um, work against that. Absolutely. Does that answer the question? But I yeah, yeah it does, thank you. I think it's you. really interesting. <laughs> yeah, I think it could be something interesting to research. Mm. I just think I, I love Harley Quinn. I've loved Harley Quinn mm. for a long time. And uh, I'm looking forward to the Suicide Squad coming out. But uh, I think it's just fascinating that this character that is actually quite a, a long stand, I mean, what, nearly 30 years old, suddenly becomes tattooed. And the way in which the tattoos become this unspoken narrative within the, the, the film, um, you know, you can see that she's tattooed, but, it, but actually those tattoos have been very carefully thought through and they're conveying a very particular and quite complex message. Um, so I suppose I, I wanted to talk about them because they were a, a neat little case history to talk about. Um, and yet, of course, you know, anyone who has tattoos, you can do the same with. You look at the style, the placement, the subject matter. Um, those of us with tattoos always have a story. You know, it's a bit morbid, but obviously when we die, decay. Yeah. Um, we lose that narrative and that story that we have on our bodies. So I thought that was like an interesting thing, how it can, you live and you have the story and then it just goes after you die. I and mean, it's like about this, because, you know, if you go to a, nowadays, if you go to a really top tattoo artist, that tattoo is worth quite a lot of money. And there have been talk about, you know, could you potentially, you know, ask for your tattoo to be kept for posterity? Could tattoos... Um, acquire value over time like other works of art on canvas do. 
Um, and the Welcome Collection have a mummified, the body of a, um, the, well, they have the skin of a, the mummified skin of a sailor. Um, and they don't know who he is, but someone obviously thought that it was worth keeping this heavily elaborately tattooed skin. Um, so, so actually there's quite a lot of talk now about, um, you know, should tattoos, um, if you, you know, should you be able to bequeath your tattoos to people? Would someone want a bit of your skin kind of framed <laughs> on the wall? Um, because yes, all of that art, all of that thought, all of that skill and talent just um, only lasts the life of its wearer. I've also heard of the tradition um, when someone passes away, you can use their ashes and uh, mix them with with ink and have that tattooed on you can them. yes yeah um, and you can do it with pets as well some people yeah. have their pets tattooed they they take the ashes and they they mix them I, I they sterilize them i'm not quite sure what the procedure is but that's becoming more and more popular so so it works both ways you know what happens to you when you die but also you can actually carry fragments of a dead loved one be they human or animal under your skin and that is a very strange um, idea, but very popular. What, what was really interesting about the, the talk, uh, and we briefly spoke about this earlier as well, uh, was when you talked about this evolution of Harley Quinn's tattoos mm. um, and how it, um, the tattoos then were slightly modified in, in, mm. the, in the next film, but um, they also changed from being something she once believed herself to be to uh, mm. remnants or uh, replicas of what she had survived. Yes. Uh, but I was personally thinking about myself and how my, my tattoo has, the, the meaning of my tattoo and the story of my tattoo has evolved even without me changing the, the physical yeah. tattoo itself. Um, and I wonder if that's something you, you have experienced yourself uh, as well. Personally, I mean, not, not just in your research. Um, I mean, the thing is, I'm not much of a one personally for commemorative tattoos. I have, my tattoos are kind of, I mean, I've got, this is my Angela Carter tattoo on my shoulder, which is actually um, drawn from images taken from one of her notebooks in the British Library. And that's the only tattoo I have that has any particular meaning. The others are images that I like. I've got um, Frida Kahlo on my oh forearm because you know I'm a Frida Kahlo nut <laughs> um, and eventually I want to extend that into a Frida Kahlo themed sleeve but other images are just images that I like um, there aren't any particular stories attached to them but what I would say is that I feel one of the reasons I like tattoos personally and why I keep on getting tattooed um, is because I just think the art form itself is amazing and I love having these images on my skin. I find it very fascinating. It's something that I see as being very attractive in others um, and that I like to have on myself. But I wouldn't say that for me, there are huge narratives. You know, I haven't got um, commemorative tattoos or tattoos that mean any particular thing. I have them because I like them and because they, they represent sort of images that appeal to me. My tattoos are very illustrative um they're often taken from um take I, I have friends who are artists and I ask if I can use their work for example mm. um so I think tattoo but then you know that in itself of course is significant I don't think you could have a tattoo without a story um you know even the story well they don't really mean anything very much well you know why do you want a um you know a, a deer skull tattooed <laughs> <laughs> on, on your chest you know what makes you what makes that appealing so so tattoos always have a narrative um I think the the personally I don't know if you if you may be too young to remember things like Miami Inc and those very popular reality tv shows um back in the sort of noughties uh which is uh, I think where the fashion for it they're, they're reality tv shows they were set in real tattoo studios but they would follow some, people would come in and have a tattoo, but there always had to be a story attached to that tattoo. You know, I'm, I'm remembering my dead son or, you know, my pet passed away or, you know, I climbed Everest or something like that. There always had to be some big narrative around it just so that the medium would work, I think. 
Um, not all tattoos have those kind of stories. I think we're led to expect that they do. But I know what you mean. I mean, for me, it, I also remember where I was whenever I had, a, you know, when I had that tattoo and the decisions that led to me having that. Absolutely. I mean, I've got a cat on my shoulder, <laughs> um, which is rather outdated now. <laughs> I need to cover it up with a dog. <laughs> But that's the thing, tattoos generate stories, whether you want them to or not, they always do.